So this will be available um, on the Berries Australia website to view later as well and for people who haven't been able to make the webinar. So we'll jump into Graham's presentation now. So Graham, you can share your screen. Very good. Okay, so thank you folks. And if all goes well, you should be able to see my screen and I'll put it into presentation mode. Here we go. Okay, so, so folks, I hope you can all hear me and I hope you can see everything okay. But uh, what I wanna do right now is to share with you a little bit about the story of how this microwave technology came to be and uh, possibly a little bit about how it actually came to be interesting to the strawberry industry in particular. So the idea of, uh, of developing something was based on some issues with herbicide resistance in weeds. And I think most people who are in agriculture understand that now. And uh, most of the uh, herbicide resistance has occurred in the last 30 odd years. So it's becoming a big issue. But one of the rather interesting uh, problems, which a lot of people were not initially aware of, is that there are also some other concerns associated with herbicide health and safety. And uh, just on the right hand side there, you can see an interesting correlation between the uh, appearance of autism uh, in six year olds and the use of glyphosate uh, around the United States. And, and that's a bit of a concern. I mean, correlation doesn't always mean causality, but it is very disturbing that they are rising uh, at the same rate. So I just want to start with a little bit of background about microwaves. So microwaves are a type of light. Uh, there's a portion of the light spectrum that our eyes can see, which is a very, very narrow band, in fact. Uh, but our body responds to other parts of the light spectrum, such as infrared. We feel that in our skin as heat. Uh, and ultraviolet, of course, uh, part of that ultraviolet spectrum actually causes a sunburn. So our skin responds to that. Uh, radio waves, I think many people are probably familiar with if you've listened to uh, the radio or if you watch TV. Uh, but microwaves are part of the, the light spectrum. And uh, the spectrum in the microwave band is very busy. So it's used for things like mobile phones, it's used for radar, it's used for other telecommunications, satellite telemetry. A whole pile of things. So because of that, there's a, a small number of frequencies which are used specifically for industrial processes. Uh, and these are listed here on the screen. So the two main ones which are of interest is uh, here in Australia, at least uh, 920, 922 megahertz. Uh, that's an industrial microwave heating frequency. Uh, and it's used in very large systems. So uh, it's used at an industrial scale for things such as the food industry. Uh, the one which you're probably all very familiar with but didn't realize is a frequency of uh, 2,550 megahertz. And that's actually the frequency that your microwave oven operates at. And uh, I think it could be safely said nowadays that almost everybody in the world has access to a microwave oven. They may not necessarily own one, but they will probably have access to one. So it's definitely the killer app when it comes to microwave heating. And that's where I started. So I, I realized that there was something that could be done in terms of trying to overcome herbicide resistance. Uh, in my area and background, which is in electrical and electronic engineering, and in particular, I've done a lot of work over many years with microwaves. Uh, so I did exactly that. I pulled apart a microwave oven and re-channeled the energy so that it could project down into the soil. And uh, that's the original prototype that you can see on the top left there. Uh, it does heat the soil uh, to a depth of probably around about four centimetres very effectively, but it, it penetrates down to almost 10 centimetres uh, as effective heating. Uh, a couple of things that it does do, uh, it immediately ruptures plant cells, and you can see this on the left-hand side at the bottom here. So this is actually a cross-section, highly magnified of some stems of some grasses. Uh, on the left-hand side is an untreated sample. On the right-hand side is one which has been exposed to microwave energy for just a couple of seconds. And you can see that there's lots of ruptures in the cells. So the actual process creates little steam explosions inside the plants. You know, bursts the cells, the plant then can't do what it normally would do, and so it dies. But one of the things that we found is that it has a long-term effect. 
uh, when we actually treat soil. So in the middle of the screen here at the bottom, there's a little video that I've put together, which is an experiment that I did in my backyard last year during COVID lockdown, where we've got effectively almost a year of control of weeds in that uh, particular environment. You'll see also that there's actually some leeks growing in the garden there. I treated up to the leeks, but I didn't actually treat where the leeks were. They're growing very happily, uh, but all the weeds are controlled. And the reason for that is because there's a, a dose response that we get when we treat seeds with microwave energy. And if we apply enough energy to raise them to a temperature of around about 80 degrees Celsius, we'll get almost 100% control of the weed seed bank. Now, that's been developed now into, well, I developed it at, at first into a trailer system, which could be taken out into the field. Uh, you can see a little video of that, which will progress on, which includes some thermal imaging. But more interestingly, it, it provides some control, immediately controlling the weeds, which are above the surface. So there's a little experiment that I did in some grass on the right-hand side there. That's one day after treatment. So you can see that the actual grass is browned off in just one day, uh, unlike what you would probably see with a herbicide control. It also provides some long-term weed control in a field environment. And on the bottom left is actually an example of some rice where we treated the soil before we planted the rice and before we flooded it. And this process of treating the soil, uh, it provides a, a huge advantage for the crop. And in the table on the bottom right hand side there, you can see the effect that microwave treatment has in terms of crop production compared to an untreated control where we just don't do anything, a herbicide treated control, or even a hand weeded control. And we're still getting, even against the hand weeded plots, uh, we're getting 16% increase in yield in a wheat uh, crop. Uh, for strawberry production, 38% increase in the runner production. Uh, these are substantial, and uh, the reason for that is because of the effect that microwave heating has on the soil and the soil microbes. It provides some level of soil sanitation. And this is some data which is uh, associated with a couple of key problems in a couple of crops. So on the left hand side is a fungus which causes black root rot. And you can see at the bottom of the screen there, uh, an array of our experimental data that we gathered for one particular replicate. We're on the far left. All of that black stuff that you see growing in those agar plates is the fungus. On the far right, uh, on a very high microwave treatment, uh, we've got the samples and uh, there's very little in the way of fungal growth that's coming out of those samples because the heating has actually killed the fungus in those samples. So it does provide again, good control over some of those pathogens which are in the soil. And uh, so with, with Scott's help, we've done some field experiments in strawberries uh, where we've actually gone out and treated plots in the field uh, to look at runner production. These are just a couple of quick examples of it. On the left-hand side is the untreated controls and you can see it's a quite a weedy patch. Uh, you can see the size of the plants. And on the right hand side is uh, a treated plot. And you can see that firstly, there is far fewer weeds. There are some weeds, unfortunately, but there are far fewer. Uh, but the crop itself is actually uh, bigger and healthier and more productive. In terms of the economics of all of this, uh, we've done some economic study on it based on some of the work that we did in the field trials. Uh, at the moment, the standard process for treating the, the fields is using methyl bromide as a fumigant. Uh, at the time when we did this assessment, it was worth about $14,000 per hectare. I think it's even a bit more now. Um, but when we looked at the prospects of using microwave uh, energy as a potential substitute for this, uh, based on my trailer system, uh, the actual costs over the life cycle of the process and the equipment uh, came in at probably around about $4,000 less than what's being spent at the moment on methyl bromide on a per hectare basis. Uh, a commercial system, we might do a little bit better uh, because there's a bit more power that's available other than what's in my trailer, which is only uh, four two kilowatt microwave systems. 
you can actually get microwave generators that are up to 100 kilowatts in capacity. I also did a, uh, based on literature, and there's, a, there's been a bit of study done on steam treatment of soil to try and achieve similar things, but it actually comes in a bit more expensive than the methyl bromide, uh, at least based on the data that we had available at the time in the literature. So uh, it's, it's looking like microwave treatment because it actually heats the moisture which is already in the soil rather than trying to heat water and then apply that to the soil is a much more efficient way to actually do this soil heating treatment process. Uh, one of the other things which is of course happening in a lot of industries is that there is a lot of waste which is being produced and in particular I've been uh, thinking about the uh, those who are doing uh, production by um, hydroponics and uh, so there's a lot of substrate which is being um, discarded on a regular basis and uh, also there's the the actual plastic wrappings that they come in and, uh, and this waste is really an unutilized resource. And so I've been looking at the prospects of actually using microwave treatment to facilitate thermal decomposition of this waste material. So plastics, the coir, which is being used to actually act as the substrate and so on and so forth. And it replicates to some extent what happens in the earth's crust to produce natural gas and oil and coal. So what we do is we actually heat the material to about 700 degrees Celsius inside a chamber, which has got very limited oxygen in it. So it doesn't burn, but it actually uh, decomposes by thermal energy. And uh, what we do is we actually get gas coming away from it, which is called syngas. We get oils, which are condensed from the vapors that come away from the material as it's heated. And we're left with a char that's left over at the end of the process. Now, the gas can be used as a fuel. The oil can be used for, as a fuel for that matter as well, but it's probably got more value as pharmaceutical uh, substrate. And the char is a really good material to use in soils. And a little experiment that we did a couple of years ago where we were growing some silver beet uh, demonstrates that very nicely. Now, the experiment was properly set up and properly randomized, but you can see here, we, it was so obvious that we lined them up so that you could see the effect. On the far left is the normal substrate that you would have if you were growing in a potting mixture. We substituted uh, for some of the, the moss that's used in the potting mix with biochar that was created during microwave pyrolysis or microwave processing, now, a little bit then a bit more, and then on the far right is the highest amount. And uh, you can see how productive the crop was when it was growing in biochar. Now, the biochar is not necessarily a, a great material in its own right, but it has lots of pores which allow it to hold water and nutrients so that plants can get access to it. And why microwave processing rather than just normal sort of heating it in a furnace? Well, microwaves are much faster. And uh, you can do the processing in minutes rather than hours or even you know, parts of days. Uh, it's more efficient. Uh, an energy balance analysis shows that it's around about one tenth of the normal amount of energy that we would use for a, a heated furnace. And it's very finely controllable. We can actually control the amount of power going into the chamber and we can also turn it off when the heating stops. So thank you for your time. I hope this has made some sense. Uh, and I'm looking forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. That was terrific. Um, does anybody have any questions? There doesn't appear to be any right now in the chat. Um, so if you would like, you know, you can raise your hand and we can get you to, we can unmute you. Um, I, I would, I, I'm excited about the biochar part of this as well as the, uh, soil disinfestation as well. And, and I'd be very excited if you could make biochar out of black plastic mulch as well as, <laughs> as yeah. hydroponic things. And also a cost-effective source for biochar because it's, I mean, there's a lot of evidence that it's a really beneficial soil additive, but it's often pretty costly mm. as well. Yeah, no, for sure. Look, I'll quickly respond to the, the story of biochar. Uh, and I noticed that there's one question from Aileen in the, in the chat yes. as well. So in terms of the biochar, uh, plastics are a wicked problem. 
because they don't actually physically break down in the environment. They just get smaller and smaller in their size. So one of the nice things about the pyrolysis process is that it does actually physically break those, those chemical bonds. So it actually turns it into a material which is much more benign. Um, the, the way that that can be done is quite nice from a microwave perspective because um, the, we can set it up so that all of the waste, whether it's you know, biological in origin or whether it's plastics or whatever, uh, as long as it's, it's in a form which can be fed into the microwave chamber, it can be processed. And, and you saw the photo that I had in, in those last couple of slides of all of the stuff that I put in and the chow that came out. So the plastic part of it doesn't bother it as, as such. Uh, just, just getting back to Aileen's question, uh, in terms of beneficial microbes, uh, one of the things we're, we're still trying to learn is what, what is happening in the soil in terms of microbial populations. But one thing we have learned, which is a very positive thing, is that some of the nitrifying bacteria in RK are actually preserved during the microwave processing. So they are very, very um, resilient to microwave heating. And in fact, what we find is that the plants get a nitrogen flush because these beneficial bacteria and, and other organisms are functioning very, very well in the post-processed soil. Okay, and Aileen's also asking how efficient is it in coarse sands in WA that have a very low water holding capacity? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, many of my first experiments were actually done in builder's sand. Uh, admittedly, they do need some moisture to, to heat quickly, um, but yeah, it, it, it does work. So I, I originally used sand as the media to do my very, very first seed treatment experiments. Uh, so yes, I know that it can and does work. That's great. And Helen is asking what happens if the soil is disturbed after you've treated it? Does it still control the weeds? Uh, to a large extent, it depends on how deep the disturbance is. So the microwave treatment itself is effective to around about four or five centimetres in depth. Uh, and in a, a minimal till environment, which is where I first started to think about application of this particular technology, uh, most of the seed bank is in the top probably one or two centimetres. So most of the seed bank would actually be disrupted uh, from that perspective. Uh, in, in berry production, I'm learning that that's probably not quite the case. And so we're looking to treat a bit deeper. But uh, yeah, as long as the disturbance is not too deep beyond the treatment zone, then uh, yeah, now we, we get pretty effective uh, control. Okay, and Sam is asking, is there any place currently doing the heating and turning into biochar around at the moment and how long would it take to break the plastic down? Uh, yeah, Sam, the answer to that is that there are a number of places here in Australia which are actually doing pyrolysis. Um, many of them are using conventional heating, so they basically put the materials into a furnace. Uh, some of them are doing it at a, at a fairly rudimentary sort of level where they have you know, a drum within a drum and they put wood around the outside drum and set it on fire basically to create the heat. Um, so, and, and that kind of a system, you basically let the, the process run for a day. So you, you light the fire and you walk away from it and a day later you come back and, uh, you know, the fire's burned down to ashes on the outside and you've got your char inside the, the inside drum. So yeah, it can be done and it is done, but uh, it's not very uh, efficient in any way, uh, the way that it's being done here in Australia, at least at the moment. And uh, I'm hopeful that we can scale up the microwave technology to the point where it can become deployable. So we can take it out into the field uh, to a particular site and just process whatever waste material there is there on the spot. And Ian Porter has asked uh, if you had a low labour cost of $25 an hour in your model, but treating a hectare will take time and probably higher labour costs. Have you considered remote controlled machinery? I feel that that question might be answered further mm -hmm. into this webinar. <laughs> yeah, it probably will. And look, Ian, yes, I, I think having autonomous vehicles is a very, very good option for this kind of technology. Look, it's not going to be like the broad acre people would like where you're traveling through the paddock at 20 kilometers per hour. Uh, that's, I don't think that's going to happen in the foreseeable future. 
Um, but it can be done and it can be as cost effective as other methods of treatment. It's just not going to be as fast. So, yeah, I think autonomy is the way probably to go. But I think Liam might address that a bit better uh, in the future. And Frank is asking how, what would you expect, what would you expect time it would take to treat soil? Uh, well, the treatment itself, actually, depending on the amount of power you have, is seconds or minutes at the most. Uh, you can then, and all we need to do is allow the soil to cool uh, before you can actually start doing something with it. So um, most of the experiments that I've done both in the field and in pots, uh, we heat the soil and, uh, and then next day we plant the crop. So uh, it, it, there's no withholding or anything like that. It's just um, as soon as the soil cools down to a temperature which is acceptable uh, for actually putting the seeds into the ground. That's great. Thanks, Graeme. Ah, was it 15 seconds per plant, Sam's asking? And then we might um, make this the last question and, and then move yeah. on to Scott. Um, yeah, look, it, Sam, it depends a bit on the amount of power that you have available in the microwave system. So uh, 15 seconds for my very low power system uh, that I have to play with. Uh, Liam will tell you a bit more about what's being developed by the GrowWave company, which is a much more powerful system than what I have available. And if we had a system which has got 100 kilowatts available to you, it would be probably fractions of a second. So it it's, just depends on the amount of microwave power that we have available to us. And Apollo's asking what temperature? <laughs> ah, well, for killing seeds, uh, we found that the threshold is probably around about uh, between 70 and 85 degrees Celsius. Uh, for killing plants, uh, measuring the temperature of the plant is, is not the easiest of things because all of the heating happens inside the plant, not outside. But, uh, but it's more about actually generating those explosions and you can actually hear those, they're audible. It's a bit like when you put milk on your rice bubbles in the morning, there's a whole pile of snap, crackle and pop. And as soon as you hear that, you know that the plant's uh, been treated enough. That's great. Well, hopefully at the end, if there are more questions for Graham and the other panellists as well, we might have some time at the end if you think of anything else you'd like to ask. So thank you, Graham. And we might move on to Scott's presentation now. So thank you. Scott, you can share your screen. Okay, bear with me. Can you see that okay? Yeah, we just, that's perfect. Perfect. Okay, so thanks, Ange. Look, so following on from Graham's um, presentation, what I'll be discussing is some of our research where, on how we applied uh, microwave technology, uh, specifically for strawberry. And now in our experiments, we were looking at crop termination with the aim of trying to control charcoal rot. So this is what charcoal rot looks like. Um, this is a shot from the strawberry industry in the United States. So it's a devastating disease. It's a crown rot disease of strawberries and it's caused by a fungus that, that lives in the soil called Macrophamina fasciolina. It's devastating because it kills strawberry plants outright and there's no fung fungicide controls for charcoal rot. And the current soil fumigants that we have at the moment are less effective than what the old fumigant methyl bromide was at controlling um, charcoal rot, the disease. So that's the disease in the United States. This is the disease in Victoria. Um, so or this year and last year, we conducted a, a quite comprehensive survey of the of the fruit industry in Victoria, we went to 75 farms. And from that survey, we found, even though growers thought that it was a mild year for disease, we still found that charcoal rot was killing 15% of plants. It reduced revenue by $16 million in the Victorian industry. And we found that the disease was present on 90% 90, 90 of the strawberry farms that we, that we went to. And importantly, we didn't find macrophamina in the strawberry nurseries in Victoria where, where they've still got um, 
methyl bromide, they're still using methyl bromide under our, uh, exemption from the United Nations. This is the life cycle of macrofemina that causes the charcoal rot disease. So it all starts in the soil. Uh, it starts in old crowns that are in the soil. And inside those crowns, the fungus lives as these microsclerotia, which are like really tiny little seeds. And these little seeds will germinate in temperatures of, of 28 to 35 degrees. And when they germinate, they uh, penetrate into the strawberry crop through natural openings in the roots or in the crowns, or they can, they can form infection pegs that directly inject threads of the fungus inside the plant. And when they do that, they release a lot of gummy materials and compounds into the water vessels of the strawberry plant. And that makes the plant wilt and die which the fungus is trying to do because it actually feeds off of the dead material. So as the crop continues to wilt and die, eventually the fungus survives in the old, the dead, the old crowns of the, of the old crop that go back into the soil and the cycle continues. So to get a better, more effective management of the disease, disease we need to break this cycle somehow. This is a picture from my colleague, Apollo Gomez. So it's showing the fungus living as these microsclerotia, these seed-like structures inside a woody crown. So living inside a woody structure gives these fungi really strong protection against some of the treatments we are using. So we know that when we fumigate soils that contain crowns, infected crowns, we don't get so good control with some of the fumigants that are available at the moment. Certainly not like what we had with methyl bromide. Methyl bromide was also a wood fumigant. So it could penetrate into these woody crowns very easily and kill the fungus. The products that we have today are not quite like methyl bromide. They've got much lower vapor pressures and boiling points. So they don't get into these woody crowns to kill the, to kill the fungus. So because of that, we've been recommending that growers remove their old plants between crops. And a lot of you have come up with some really innovative ideas on how to remove those plants using potato harvesters and carrot harvesters. Um, but the problem is that it, it leaves quite a considerable amount of waste that you've got to manage and get off farm. And it's quite expensive to do this. So we had a look and thought about is there opportunities to try and control the fungus at the crop termination phase. So crop termination is simply the practice of killing old strawberry plants and then cultivating them back into soil before you prepare your beds and plant a new crop. And in Australia, growers are most commonly using herbicides um, to terminate their crop. But this treatment isn't killing the macrofemina inside the crowns. And in fact, in some cases, it may be exacerbating the problem because the fungus can actually feed on some of this dead material. So we looked at the opportunity of using microwave to terminate the crop at the end of the season. So this is a picture of the microwave unit that we used. It was a five kilowatt um, unit. And the aim of our experiment was to terminate the old strawberry crop and also try to kill the macrofemina inside the crowns before, before we turn them back into the soil. We had uh, microwave treatments uh, where we exposed plants to 10 seconds or 15 seconds exposure. Um, we went on the really high end because we wanted to see what effect um, microwave would have on the, on the plants. 
And we had some comparison treatments. We had herbicides, Basta and Garlon together. So that's a pretty strong herbicide treatment. And we compared it with untreated um, plots as well. It was a pretty large experiment. So we had uh, eight plots of each treatment with a hundred plants in each. So we were looking at just over 3000 plants in our experiment. Um, so we did the experiment in December last year and it was located at Sylvan. So here's some of the results. So immediately after treating plants with the microwave, we put in a temperature probe into the middle of the crown. And so an exposure to 10 seconds of microwave heated the crown to 81 degrees centigrade. With 15 seconds, we were getting 96 degrees centigrade. So these type of temperatures can, they're obliterating most living things. And strawberries were no exception. So we're able to get really good kill rates of the old strawberry crop with the microwave treatment. And in fact, we were killing off the strawberries a little bit quicker than very strong herbicide treatments. So this is what it looks like. Here's our microwave treatment. So you can see that the old strawberries are completely obliterated. This was the herbicide treatment and now untreated with the, the plants still surviving. But it was important that we killed the old strawberry crop but also we were killing the macrophamina inside their crowns. So in, orange, in green here, you see the amount of macrophamina that was in the crowns in the untreated and the herbicide treatments. And both microwave treatments were really obliterating the macrophamina. And interestingly, we also had some fusarium inside the crowns as well. Fusarium is another pathogen that causes a wilt. It's a really important uh, pathogen in sands in, in Western Australia. And the microwave crop termination treatment was also obliterating that fungus as well. This is what it looks like in real life. So we took pieces of the crown from the different treatments and we plated the Montuagar. And you can see that in the untreated and in the herbicide treatments, the macrophamina fungus was growing away quite successfully from these crowns. That's, it's the black fungus. And you can also see Fusarium growing away as well. That's the pink fungus. So any of these crowns returned back into the soil from the untreated or herbicide treatment uh, plots would be able to infect new, new strawberry plants. You compare that with the microwave treatment, you can see that the, that the crowns are pretty much sterile. So we're reducing the amount of fungus that we're putting back into the soil. So there were some other benefits of using microwave for crop termination. And one of them was we were getting better control of weeds in the planting holes after the treatment as well. So the most common weed at the site was ground cell. And you can see that the microwave treatment is reducing weed emergence much more than the herbicides treatments. Interestingly as well, even though we were targeting the microwave treatment to the soil surface, we were still getting some quite good kill of the macrophamina in the soil and also another uh, pathogen called Pythium in green. Um, Pythium is a, a pathogen that infects roots of strawberries and, and causes a root rot and stunt. So within the top zero to 2.5 centimetres, we were reducing the DNA concentrations of these pathogens with the microwave. So there was a little bit of evidence that we were getting some soil disinfestation effect as well. But clearly we need to improve the efficiency of, of 
crop termination with microwave. It's, it's quite a long treatment if you've got a million plants and you want to expose each plant to 10 seconds of microwave treatment. So we're looking at engineering improvements. So Liam's going to be talking about a higher power microwave unit that he's got. And there's also consideration of autonomous units that, that will improve the efficiency. There's also biological improvements. So we need to understand the temperature thresholds that kill macrophamina in old crowns much better especially when we're thinking that we might be following those treatments with a, a soil fumigation. So preliminary results in the laboratory, we're seeing that we might only have to heat the crowns to 60 degrees. And so that translates to a much shorter treatment time and higher efficiency. So considering that we've been seeing some um, soil disinfestation uh, effects with the microwaving crop termination, we've also been looking at the prospect of microwave for actually treating soils. So we've done quite a little bit of work now in the strawberry nursery industries at Talangi. Um, so I've got a little video here similar to what um, Graham was showing. Um, so this is the microwave treatment. So when I play it, you'll see that there's that there's steam coming out of the soil. Uh, it's a little bit noisy, but I'll play it quickly. So those with those treatments, we are able to get the soil within the top 10 centimeters to about 70 to 80 degrees centigrade. That was with the three kilowatt unit. And correspondingly, if we look at the amount of pythium pathogens in the soil, we can see that we can reduce those populations quite significantly down to 10 centimetres. Below 10 centimetres is where it starts to drop away. Um, and we're thinking about other treatments that we can use, different wavelengths, of microwave that will enable us to target the soil at much greater depth. So even with the microwave treatments that we've used so far, we're getting some really good control of weeds when we treat soils. That's um, quite long, uh, long lived effect. And here also is some of the growth responses that we get with microwaves. So it's a similar effect to what we see with fumigants. There's an increased growth response of strawberries after treating soils with microwave. So then just in conclusion, like our preliminary research has really proved the concept uh, that microwave is effective for crop termination. It can kill strawberries, um, but it also can kill the pathogens that are harboring inside the old strawberry crop. And it's also got the capacity to disinfest soil, but we need some further research to improve its efficiency and work out how we can integrate it with other treatments to manage charcoal rot more effectively. Um, I just want to point out too that the, the National Charcoal Rock Program ended last year where we were doing a lot of research on how to manage charcoal rot more effectively. And there's greater opportunities to improve our management of this disease. And, and the use of microwave is an important example. So if you, it's, if you want more of this type of research on charcoal rot, um, like the use of microwave, it's it's really important that you let your representatives at Horticulture Innovation know about that. So I'll leave it there and I think I'll open it up to questions next. So if anybody has questions, you can either raise your hand or type them in the chat box.
Um, Angela, I think we were going to do some questions to the um, registrants as well. So you have to do your little poll thing. Yeah. Okay. And we do the poll to start off with. So we were going to ask the um, the participants here whether they've seen significant losses on their properties due to soilborne diseases. So I guess we're really targeting this question to the growers in the audience. So I think if I'm right, Angela, there's um, clickers at the, the panelists. The, um, can you, can you, oh yes, so maybe you can't see it as a panelist, but the poll is up and we've got six out of the 21 people have voted. So um, if, if you're on a, laptop or an iPad, I'm not sure how it works on a phone, you can just click on your answer here. Um, so we've still got a few more people who could. Anyone else? wanting to put in an answer here before I finish the poll. So um, you might not be able to see it, Scott, but uh, the results are that 38% uh, of people say, yes, they've seen significant losses in most seasons, 25% occasionally, 25% no, not significant losses, and 13% never out of the people who have voted so far. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, and we've got some, I don't know if you can see, can you see the results of that now? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. And we have some questions here. So mm -hmm. um, Michael Petnella says, now using imperative plastics, um, that's probably improved plastics. If you lift plastic and microwave bed with plant residues, will it give better results? Um. Yeah, so that's an, an important question because we, I mean, we, we, in this experiment, we were looking at microwave, but we do want to integrate this treatment with other treatments as well, including um, fumigation following the crop termination phase. Um, so the use of impermeable plastics is still really important to improve control of charcoal rot. So impermeable plastics um, they stop the movement of fumigants from the soil after you treat the soil. And it means that you get greater concentrations of, of fumigants in the soil for a longer time. And we know that if you do that pra practice, it can significantly improve um, the amount of, or reduce the amount of charcoal rot in soils. So we need to work out how we integrate microwave with those other traditional treatments. And Aileen has asked, is the ultimate aim to replace fumigation with this process rather than still have to do both microwave and fumigation? I think that's something that we're aiming for. I mean, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it's certainly something that we're very interested in. So following up to from Michael's question, we can apply microwave treatment through plastic mulch. So there is an opportunity to even treat um, beds in situ with microwave. Um, we need to look at different hours and different um, wavelengths to make sure that we're getting that effective depth of control that we want that's similar to soil fumigation. But it is the ultimate aim. And Apollo has his hand up, but he's also typed a question. Apollo, Apollo you can speak, I think, now. Can you hear me, Scott? Yeah, I'm watching. Um, yeah, the, that first comment on the chat was, um, yeah, I think Scott uh, addressed in terms of having both treatment would be good in a way. One for the, at the end of the season to reduce um, charcoal rod in the crowns, and then obviously to fumigate at the subsequent season to reduce soil inoculum. Uh, Scott, I just wanted to make the comment, uh, great work. That's really interesting and, and really good. A um, couple of questions. Yep. In terms of, yeah, I just couldn't type quickly enough. <laughs> uh, in terms of the trial, uh, the one in December last year, uh, it'd be interesting to see the severity uh, this year 
in terms of what may happen? Um, have you started to see any um, indications yet in terms of, um, I guess, are there plants already on the ground in that same block that was treated? Yeah, that's essential, Apollo. So we've marked out all of those plots and we'll be following yeah. the disease through the season. So um, look, we're only going to see the, the disease appearing in, in summer, as you're aware. So it takes yeah. a while for us to be able to see like, no, 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 the fruits of that, of that treatment. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what, what uh, develops. And, and were they fumigated as well, Scott, or did you just leave it uh, after the... No, they will be fumigated. So it, yeah. it, it will be treated with um, the TF80. Yeah. And, and the other one was uh, in terms of the, the pathogen in the soil that you get the recovery of the DNA. How, lo how long did you sample the soil after the treatment? Um, I asked that question oh. because um, I've, I've um, done in vitro tests of uh, charcoal rot microsclerosia or microfilament microsclerosia and I exposed it to temperatures of about 50 degrees for seven days straight mm -hmm. um, and obviously compared it with microsclerosia going on 30 degrees mm -hmm. and it was chalk and cheese you know there was growth in the 30 degrees and and nothing on the 50 degrees however I put those plates back at 30 degrees and the microsclerosia actually grew so I'm um, just wondering, yeah, in terms of uh, how, how long was it after treatment and then did you sample sort of like- okay, the, So for the DNA, we were sampling after two weeks. So there's a possibility that some of, even some of the DNA that we recovered was actually dead organism. Yeah. So it might actually be better than what we, than what we saw in our results. Um, and in terms of the, um, the plates, we'd, le we'd left them for a full month before um, we threw them away. So yeah, there was very little that grew out of those, those treated uh, crowns. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, no, because uh, it was interesting that I thought I had controlled them at 50 degrees. Um, yeah, um, you know, for seven days straight. But then when I put it back to 30, uh, I was amazed that it, it, you know, it continued to grow as well. So um, yeah. I thought I just mentioned that. All right, thanks, Scott. Great work, and cheers again. Um, and we've got a question here from Tina. Scott, can we use microwave system to kill weeds between strawberry rows, but it won't damage our strawberry plants? Uh, that could be something that could be looked at, and I'm not sure that it's been a commercial focus quite yet. Um, but yeah, the, the, from what we've measured, and Graham might correct me, but I don't think that we've seen too much lateral movement of the heat away from where the antenna is. So it may be possible to treat weeds within the, the interrows. Okay. Well, thanks, Scott. We might um, move on to Liam now, just so we don't run out of time. And we might have a few minutes at the end if anybody has any more questions for Graham or Scott. Thanks, Angela. Can you see that? Yep, we just need it in presentation mode. Excellent. Beautiful. All righty, thanks for joining everyone. So I guess this is pretty good end to tie it all together. So Graham's focused on kind of the initial study and how we came across this as a potential technology. And Scott really helped us take this to the field to make sure it works, you know, there's good efficacy in the field. And now Growways, uh, which, is a, which is a private company, is taking that technology and commercialising that so the growers can, you know, use this as a product or a service. So my name's Liam. I'm the head of product at Growways. And we're really trying to focus on some of these key issues in agriculture, in terms of pathogen control and weed seed banks uh, in multiple crops. So we're seeing around the world, like Graham said, really severe herbicide resistance, and that's something that we're really focused on. But importantly, in Australia, uh, Europe and the US, we're seeing increased regulation really restrict access to certain chemicals. And I think that's been very uh, present in the strawberry industry with methyl bromide phased out. And so we're trying to be that technology that can replace some of these fumigants and chemicals as they get phased out. I think that's one, it's a good, it's a great to have an alternative, uh, you know, economic solution to that. But also, 
we're seeing consumers really demand higher, you know, clean, green food. And this is a way you can really brand, you know, your produce as kind of the next generation when we're talking about, you know, electrifying the farm and also, you know, automation and really cleaning up, you know, some of those practices. I think really importantly as well uh, within the strawberry industry, we're really focused on, you know, this is a much cleaner technology to use, especially for the actual user. Um, and that's something we're really passionate about is not having some of those, you know, safety risks with using some of those dangerous ingredients. And so I guess we're really just trying to disrupt, as a, as a young Australian company, really trying to disrupt this chemical industry and bring forward electri electrification to that. And so what, what is our technology and solution? And that is applying microwave energy. And I think really importantly, our core technology is how we actually apply that to the field. And so we want a really targeted, efficient approach in a heating, uh, you know, whether it be the, the weed seed bank or the, the strawberry crown, which will take out the pathogen. And a few key parts of this technology is that it's, it can penetrate, and we're seeing that as it can you know, penetrate right into the strawberry crown or into the soil, as compared to some other technologies like steam and you know, other heating uh, characteristics that really struggle to get inside the crown. And also we're really working on using this as a really precise tool. We don't want this to be a kind of a blanket treatment where you just treat the whole row. We really want to focus this in on just the crown. So we're starting to integrate, you know, lateral movement and camera vision so we can actually really target this uh, at, at the problem. And so our solution so far has been on our trailer at the back here, which was our first field unit that we took out last year. And this enabled us to have some really good learnings. I think we had some really interesting trials within the vegetable uh, industry, looking at taking out nut grass and other uh, problem weeds. And also in the strawberry industry, taking out pathogens in the viticulture, taking out weeds beneath the rows, and also some other pathogens uh, within the cotton industry. And so that was our first field unit. Uh, and well, I'll show you out the next one uh, going forward. And so I guess we really want to change the way I guess some of this weeding and pathogen control is done. So we're, we want to be kind of a, a proactive rather than a reactionary approach to taking out some of these issues. And so with that, instead of, you know, fumigating next year and, you know, waiting for, you know, the, the pathogen to spread throughout the soil, we want to come in right at the end of the season and take that out. So like Scott said, it doesn't really spread throughout the next year. And really importantly, it's instantaneous. So as you do this treatment, there's no withholding and waiting for the chemicals to be effective or anything like that. So it's really hopefully, even though it's a slow technology right now, over time, you know, the actual time you need on the field or the time, you know, to take effect is, is much lower. But of course, we want this technology to improve, you know, the profit uh, of your farm. So we're really looking forward to the increase in yield that we're going to get uh, later this year, or we're hoping, you know, hoping to see that really good data there. You're not going to have to go over the field as many times. And also, importantly, reduce some of the safety and, and risk associated uh, with some of those chemicals. And so, Thanks everyone for joining today. And that's kind of why we've got you guys all on board is because we're really hoping to target the strawberry industry because it's a high, a high valley crop and it's really highly affected by pathogens. And also this is a really big problem in, in California. And so we're going to do some field trials over there next year. And I think this is kind of one of our early markets that we're really targeting as a, as a company. And so like Scott mentioned, this is our first field result. And I think I'll probably explain maybe kind of the economics and the practicality of the treatment. And so initially in the first uh, treatment, we did manual uh, moving the, the actual applicator between plants. And so that was time intensive and slow, but as the technology is gonna improve, we're really gonna automate all of these parts. And so that's my, my focus as an engineer is taking those initial you know, efficacy trials and scaling them up to a much more efficient, efficient treatment. Um, and so as you can see here on the left, we've got our alpha unit. I'll show you what we're building in the moment. That's actually what I'm doing today is building this next one. And this is gonna show that we can actually have this system drive along by itself and treat the uh, strawberry plant as it drives continuously. And so that's kind of the first step away from me lifting to kind of getting towards that automation. The next one is our beta, and this will be a self-contained unit. The first one was powered by a PPO. This one will be self-contained, so it can go 
still go quite slow, but it'll be able to stop above the plan and go to the next one and the next one. And this will start integrating uh, autonomy and just making sure it can drive by itself so you don't have to worry about labour costs associated with you know, a slow moving vehicle. But of course, we want to get to our commercial unit. And so that'll either be a larger self uh, supplied uh, system or we'll go behind a tractor. You know, everyone has a tractor with ability, you know, for 100 horsepower. So it's really good if we can use some of that power uh, to drive our system. And so this is the unit um, working on at the moment. And you can see here, this is much smaller than our first version. And so this is our system that we're going to have to go right above the plan. And so this will be ready for the field if all goes well in a few weeks. And this will be able to drive down a row of strawberries, treating uh, each crown as we go along. And this is going to improve the robustness from last time and really hopefully get really good control consistently of, of those strawberry plants. And so going forward, we really want to decrease that, that time. I think a few people have made comments um, in, the, in, the, in the message part here, just saying, you know, is, is this actually ever going to be practical? And so what we're looking at already, you know, that 10 seconds, I think we can reduce that time potentially by a factor of 10, so down to one second or or, or less of plan. The way we'll do that is to increase power, but importantly, it's also just to increase the efficiency of how we actually target the energy. And that's in our first field trial, we were quite low on that efficiency. And so we can engineer and improve that system to speed up the time. And so what we're gonna do in the next trial is do less, uh, less time and higher power and see if we can still get good efficacy at higher speeds. And we'll just keep iterating and improving that system so we get to you know a, a commercial speed. I'm really confident we can get to that commercial speed. And so, like I said, next year we're going to start looking to develop, uh, deploy our, our full system onto the farm. And this is something that I really would like your input as growers um, to get some interested parties who would like to see some trials of this. Because you know, as a as a tech company, we really got to test this, and I want to get it out in the field, see how it works in the real world tested against different different scenarios, different you know weather conditions, different size farm, different beds and everything like that. I really want to test this you know, out, out in its true working state. And so I think I'd really love uh, some input from, from, the, from the growers and anyone else on the call today. So really looking at how we as a company can, in, can improve and how we can actually bring this technology to farm. Because I think you, know, you see a lot of tech in the lab and we really want to get this as a product or a service you guys can use. So I think I'll get Angela to pop a few questions in. And so I think, first of all, would you guys use this technology? And do you see this as a technology that you really would like to be a, you know, become some of your consistent treatments throughout the year, you know, part of your control mechanism for certain pathogens? So would you use it? And then how would you use it? Do you want this to be a service? Do you want this to be a product that you buy? And just Open, uh, let's just open the floor to anyone who's got some input as to how you would kind of like this technology and uh, good transparency between someone who's developing it and someone who's hopefully going to use it. So thanks everyone for joining today and let's hopefully have some good questions. Do you want to throw that one up, Angela? Yep, thanks, Liam. That's great. So we've got the first poll up here. I think we have to do this one before we can do the next one. Um, in the meantime, sure. though, um, We've got a comment here. Michael Pedinella has said, controlling nut grass, that's a godsend. And Alien has asked, is this system being looked at for the nursery industry, interested in status and progress? So you mean um, not strawberry nurseries, plant ornamental horticulture nurseries, I'm guessing, maybe. Yeah, good, good question. Um, we haven't done any trials within the nursery industry, but that's definitely something uh, would be would be open to. And so we've done other trials in pots and different systems that are probably similar. And that's looking at removing you know, seed and sterilizing the soil. So definitely feel free to reach out, uh, Lene, if you're interested in a trial. And I think real, the good part you know, about this technology is we can go through plastic. So if you already got the soil in pots, we can just kind of come over and plastic is a non-issue for us. So that could, could integrate well, but yeah, reach out my email is at the end here um, and if you want to see how it goes and so eight out of ten people said that they would definitely be interested in this 
Liam. Fantastic. So, um, the second poll that we have is, would you prefer this as a product, like buying the unit or a service? Um, and if anyone else has any other questions too, if you want to type them in the chat or raise your hand. <clears throat> Is, is it fair in saying that fumigation, some fumigation is done as a service and some is done by the growers across the industry? I think with um, one of the companies, one of the fumigants available is done as a service. If anybody wants to correct me, um, feel free to put your hand up or, or write it in the chat. But I think the EDN fumigas is still done as a I think Lucci has his hand up. Lucci, you're allowed to talk now. Um, you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Um, as far as I know, only Talangi use the service or anyone that's brought acre at uh, fumigating. But um, I, I, I dare say, uh, you know, nearly 100% of the strawberry growers would be using... Um, their own methods, tractors and fumigation equipment. Okay. Yeah, so having a system that can kind of go behind a tractor is something that would kind of integrate well, maybe as an alternative. Yeah, so any other questions? There's the the second poll, Liam, if you can see that. Yeah, great. And I guess maybe I'll ask another question to the growers. So in terms of this, you'd come in to do this post-crop emanation. How, how long do we have within a year to do that treatment? I think it probably varies on which state but how many weeks or months kind of is that crop available to be terminated? And like, how, how fast do you need this to be turned around kind of on a, on a hectare basis? Does anybody want to give Liam some feedback on that? Um, oh, Luchi, has got your hand up again, hang on. Uh, can you can you hear me now? Yes. Um, yeah. Listen, we've we've got a fair bit of time in, in termination of of crops. Uh, generally, we finish. Uh, uh, there's two times of the year to finish. Some people finish at, at Christmas with certain varieties, and some people finish around about June. So you've got those months after that. I guess one of one of my questions, which I wanted to ask earlier on, forgot about, is. Um, uh, from what I understand, it actually needs moisture and it heats that water up. So does it matter if, I mean, so what, what's the ideal moisture, moisture level of, of the soil? Is it 100%? Is it 70%, 80%, a minimum of 60%? Could that be answered? Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, so it kind of, it'll actually, because we're aiming to do the crown, they'll always have, you know, some moisture in it. So... Soil moisture doesn't really matter when we're just treating the crown. Um, but in terms of if we were looking at kind of that maybe as fumigation earlier on or soil treatment, yeah, the, the soil moisture will play a part. Um, the high, if you have really high moisture, yeah, it'll use more energy and take longer. But anything with a small amount of moisture, um, kind of above, you know, 20, 30 uh, percent will be fine to treat. And so we're, we're working with farmers at the moment, we've done trials on low and high moisture. And so you get deeper penetration when it's lower moisture, like it varies a little bit. Um, but then with the high moisture, you get shallow, but it takes a bit longer. So I think that's something you could probably optimise with the grower as to what they were trying to achieve kind of as a partnership of prep, prep, preparing the field and then also our, our, our treatment. So you've got a pretty big window there for moisture. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Feedback yeah. on the timeline. Another question here in Queensland, we'd be looking at it for replacement of fumigation of the soil. 
time frame would be October to February. Um, any other questions from anyone for Liam? Um, and we've got a few minutes left before the webinar sort of finishes. So if anybody has some other questions, perhaps for Graham or Scott as well. Uh, here we go. Tina says, how much does it cost? Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, so at the moment, cost too much, um, but we're we're hope we're going to get it down to so it's right in line with other fumigation costs and things like that, and go even lower because our only input is diesel, you know, or, or energy. So depending on what you what you really pay for that, we're going to get it down, you know, um, with methane sodium like cost like that kind of per, on a per hectare basis. So you. Of course, our business won't exist if it's not cost effective to the growers. So we're hoping to get it down kind of in line with methane sodium and other fumigation. And do, do we have any growers that would be interested in trials either this year or next year? So, so we can start when we get our next, our beta unit out, we're looking to do larger field trials. Is there any growers that are interested uh, in trialing this going forward? Feel free to reach out or Tag that in the chat and I can follow up. Yeah, if, if anybody wants to put respond in the chat, we can put you in touch with Liam. Any state, uh, as long as we're optimistic with COVID next next year, then yes, any state, any state's fine. Can I just say that Liam is in New South Wales at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> Not moving far at all. And Ian Porter's asked, have you done a life cycle analysis on energy costs and greenhouse gas emissions? Yes, uh, early days on that, but yeah, as we are uh, some of our key investors in the company, that's pretty important to them. And so in comparison to chemicals, um, yes, we, we do look at that. And we're hoping you know, to integrate some hydrogen or battery technology in the not too distant future. So really yeah, focused on bringing down that the greenhouse gas emissions. So great question. And I can follow up if you're interested. Um, yeah. okay. any, anybody and else have their hands up for trials? Sorry, Liam. Um, and if you want to get in touch with Liam, his email and, and mobile number is there on screen. Green. So. Great. All right. Thanks, Apollo. Well, thanks, Liam. Are there any other final questions anybody, any uh, growers would have for any of our speakers um, before we finish up? You can raise your hand or type something in, no? Well, I'd just like to thank all three of our speakers, Graham, Scott and Liam, for their presentations and sharing their work with us. That was really, really, really interesting. Um, lots of thanks and comments, really interesting. Thanks so much in the chat now. Um, and thank you to everybody who attended for uh, coming along on a sunny afternoon to join a webinar and uh, thank you and and if anybody wants to get in touch with any of the speakers um, just if you didn't write down Liam's email or phone number or you want to get in touch with anyone else just give me a email or a call thank you yeah oh, is there anything else in the chat no, lots of lots of good comments. Thanks everybody. Thank you.